Having wardrobe problems. <laughs> you want me just to hold it like this? No, 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 no. Flip, flip the chair, please. Oh, thank you. <laughs> like straight in the middle? Yeah, yeah, I would. You're not going to get it. <laughs> it you, you can't win. Wait, can you hear me talking? Okay. I did. Hello, good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my fellow Beam team member, Susie Vitale. Yay, jazz hands. Um, <laughs> Susie is the FIB SEM microbeam specialist at GL, as you may or may not know. Uh, she is here to operate our brand new state of the art FEI Helios PFIB G4. I got it right. And also the Zeiser Riga SEM. Uh, Susie's expertise is in TEM sample preparation, especially powders and particles. And she also has a strong background in 3D imaging and analysis, high resolution imaging, EBSD, and qualitative EBS. I don't say. Very good, very Thank good. You. Um, before she came to join us here at GL, she ran the FIB STEM lab at Sandia National Lab out in California. You did. You did. Not even in Albuquerque or anything. Um, <laughs> uh, while she was there, she imaged, fibbed, and characterized a wide variety of materials, including polymers, ceramics, metals, metal alloys, composites, and metal organic frameworks. And today, she's going to give us an overview of CIW's newest cutting edge capability. Thank you, Emma that outstanding introduction. Anytime. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay, great. So that's exactly what I'm here to do today is to talk to you about the dual beam, FIBSEM, um, specifically the one that we have just purchased here at Carnegie. Um, I'm gonna apologize right now. I have got that lingering cough left over from the flu and I will hack and cough through most of this talk. So in addition to hearing the sound of my voice, you get to hear the sound of my cough. All right, <clears throat> so Today, we're gonna go over just some microscopy basics, get us all on the same page. I'm gonna tell you what a FibSEM is, uh, some applications uh, for FibSEM use, and then I'm gonna give you some FibLab updates, which most of you will think is probably the most exciting part of the talk. All right, some basics. So what you can see with your eyeball, the unaided eye, can see something or resolve objects as small as 100 microns and that is about the width of one of the hairs on your head, okay? So no help, that's about the smallest thing that we can see. With the aid of an optical microscope, uh, you, the, the human eye can resolve objects as small as 100 nanometers. So they're a helpful little guy. But uh, if you wanna see something smaller than 100 nanometers, uh, you need a scanning electron microscope, which is, this is our uh, SEM down in the basement of Ableton. You can resolve an object as small as 0.7 nanometers using an SEM. And the reason that is, is because of the way light works. So the, our resolution limitation has to do with the wavelength of the light that we're using to resolve the object. So the, the visible spectrum, or the visible light, maxes out at about, uh, according to this equation, about 220 nanometers, but we can usually get down to 100. So this is, uh, if you wanna then see something smaller than this, you just have to decrease the wavelength of the light you're using to image your sample. So that's why I kind of don't like the term optical microscope. It's actually a visible light microscope because it uses visible light and uh, glass lenses to magnify what it is that we're trying to see. And then we use our eyes, we make sense of what we're seeing with, we detect that signal, that, those photons with our eyes, we make sense of it using our brain. And on an electron microscope, we're using electrons, which is a UV range of light. We use electromagnetic and electrostatic lenses to focus the light, to focus the electrons. And then we have a suite of detectors off the side of the instrument that detect that secondary signal coming out of the sample. And then the computer, uh, the detector sends a signal to these computers which makes sense of the signal that's being detected so that we can make sense of it with our eyes at that point. So that's SEM, the difference between visible light microscope and an, and an SEM. So not only um, does the wavelength of the light have something to do, uh, affect our resolution, the higher the energy of the electrons, it, it also become, the wavelength becomes lowered, and so we get even higher resolution. So an SEM 
the energy range is from 500 volts to 30 kV. Again, the resolution is about 0.7 nanometers. But if we use a bigger microscope, the transmission electron microscope, those can actually go up to, they range from 40 kV to 300 kV, and some of them actually go up into the millivolts. There's some spe uh, very special TEMs uh, designed just for very specific projects that, that do the highest resolution imaging. They also destroy your sample very quickly if it's beam sensitive at all. And you can get uh, to a one angstrom resolution with a TEM. And so there you're seeing, you're seeing atoms, which I think is really cool. Um, so in an SEM, you are imaging a bulk sample. And what I mean by that is it's just a chunk of sample. So it's a chunk of rock, <coughs> or it's <coughs> a thin section on a glass slide or a piece of metal. And um, <coughs> when we hit this bulk, we call it, this is the primary electron beam that we are generating with the SEM. It hits a sample and makes this thing we call an interaction volume. And from this interaction volume is where your signal comes out. So we get secondary electrons, we get backscattered electrons. We also get characteristic x-rays, which provide, um, this is what we use for energy dispersive x-ray spectroscopy, or EDS. So you can see here our beam, you know, it's got this nice spot size here. It's nice and small. So we think maybe that's what we're resolving but you're actually resolving this entire volume. So you can see it's much wider down here than it is up at the surface. So your spatial resolution is limited by the width or the volume of this interaction volume. So if you want to increase your spatial resolution, then you have to decrease your interaction volume. Any guesses on how we do that? You cut it thinner. I think somebody said that. That is the right answer. So if you remove the bulk, then you have this thin sample, and now your spatial resolution is much smaller. And that is what we have to do anyway for a TEM, because a TEM is a transmission electron microscope. So in an SEM, we raster the beam across the surface, and we scan, and then we get these signals, and that's the detector it detects. Here, we actually transmit through the entire sample. And the signals are a lot more, there's a lot, there are many more signals that can be detected in a TEM. The TEM sample is electron transparent, so we, we get these forward scattering signals through the sample, but we also get these backscattered signals up from the top, and we can do both TEM mode, where we transmit through, and we can also do STEM mode, which is scanning transmission electron microscopy, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But wrapping up with just SEM, um, the signals that you get off the SEM give you different bits of information. So the secondary electrons, one of our signals is, is focused at the surface of the sample, and so that signal gives us excellent topography information. This is a piece of fractured steel. So somebody took a piece of steel and then just cracked it, and I think that looks so cool. I think it looks like the ocean or something, like a black and white picture of the ocean, but this is just the surface of that steel. Um, a little bit deeper down, you get the backscattered electrons, and that gives you Z contrast. So this is a carbon wire that's been embedded with silver, so in a Z contrast image, your high Z material is bright, your low Z material is dark. So here the carbon is dark and the silver is bright. And again, like we talked just a minute ago, these are these characteristic X-rays that can generate these nice uh, EDS maps. So each uh, energy that comes, each X-ray has a specific energy, and the software will assign a color to that energy, which will give you this new color map of your sample. So. Uh, also, one last thing I want to point out, this is our SEM, and this might look different to some of you who haven't been down <coughs> in the basement for a while, but this is our old fib, for those of you who might remember. This was the poor little fib that couldn't fib. But let me tell you what, she can really SEM, and it's an outstanding SEM. We've got about 20 users trained up to use it now, and, and everyone seems to be really pleased with its performance. Pretty basic, ranges from 500 volts to 30 kV. It's got a whole suite of detectors, including a STEM detector and an EDS system. So if you're interested in learning to use it or be trained on it, let me or Emma know. All right, that's the basics. So what's a fib stem? Well, every fib stem is a fib stem. It is a dual beam. It has a fib and it has an SEM. So here's the SEM part, just like a, a standard SEM. Oh, and this is our new fib, by the way. Here she is with her covers off. This will be the most risque image in the talk. <laughs> it's also got an ion gun, and that is the FIB. That is the focused ion beam at 52 degrees incident to the uh, electron beam. 
It's got a gas injection system, which are some organic, metallo-organic hydrocarbons. Uh, so basically it's like, it, we, we have tungsten, it's about 20% tungsten, the rest is hydrocarbons. It's a powder that sits in um, a crucible. So we heat up the crucible, it generates a gas that flows down this needle, and then rastering either the electron beam or the ion beam over that little gas cloud, you can deposit material onto the sample. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. It also has a lift out needle, which is this uh, tungsten micro manipulator, in situ micro manipulator that you can go in and for TEM sample prep especially, this is what you'll use to extract things out of the bulk. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. <coughs> and it has, whoops, it has a vacuum chamber, a nice big one where we keep our samples. Clean, because you always wear gloves, right? That's right. All right, so a fib is a focus ion beam. But what makes a focus ion beam a fib? Because some focus ion beams we have here are not fibs. Like on the nanosims, that is essentially a focus ion beam. And I don't know about how the ICPMS things work, but those are kind of like, they're, they're not focused, Tim? Focus it is a focus ion beam? Okay, so there we go. But it's not a fib, right? Okay, so what makes a fib, a focus ion beam a fib is it is site-specific material removal, and we do not care about the uh, material removed. So in the nanosims, you, know, you are sputtering away material, and then you're analyzing that sputtered away material. Material Here we just hog the heck out and we don't care where it goes. Well, we do kind of, but we don't care about it. And also a fib is equipped for material, material extraction and manipulation. So, you know, it's going to have a lift out needle, it's going to have a GIS system, because 95% of these things are used for TEM sample prep. Uh, fibs are also described by their sources. So <clears throat> we have, on the tiny side, we have helium and neon. On the giant side, we have xenon. This is what we have. And then the kind of Goldilocks fib, probably 90 to 95% of the fibs um, on, in the market right now are gallium fibs. So down here, you've got low current and very high resolution, but small length scale work. And what I mean by that is if, because a fib is designed for material manipulation and extraction, you're removing, manipulating, extracting extremely small bits. So we're on the nanometer scale here. Up at xenon, it's high current, very high current. Low, relatively low resolution, but extremely large length scale. So you're removing and uh, manipulating material at the millimeter level. Um, our new fib is really cool because it spans um, into this Goldilocks range, which, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but gallium, kind of does a little bit of everything. It's, it's, it can't do the super tiny work, it can't do the super big work, but it gets a majority of the work done, uh, which is why it's been the uh, workhorse instrument of the FIB world for since the 90s. Well, the 70s, but we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so on the, on, the, on the tiny end, this is called a gas field ionization source. <coughs> and honestly, I, they're not even really considered FIBs anymore. Um, we really just refer to them now as the helium ion microscope. And the reason that is, is because uh, after about five or six years of having these in the field, we realize that you just, there, there's just not enough practical fib work that you can do with these things. And there's a couple reasons why. First, this is how you generate the beam. So you have this atomically sharp tip, and then you're actually focusing three individual uh, helium atoms on the tip of this needle called the trimer. And this trimer is very, un it's relatively unstable. Um, I, th I would call it really unstable. Uh, it only lasts a few hours, at best a few days. And it's not a small thing to actually align the beam to get this trimer to form. So if, um, I actually have a colleague at Pacific Northwest National Laboratories who has one of these and I spent a day with him on the instrument and it's really fussy to get the trimer to form. And when it, it's gone, doesn't matter what you're doing, you gotta stop and have the super user come in and align the beam for you again. So that's annoying. Um, but the main reason that this doesn't really have a lot of FIB impl implications anymore is because um, the main customer for FIBs is the semiconductor industry. FIBs uh, were, they came about in the 1970s mostly as circuit edit machines for silicon. And so gallium and silicon get along really well, that's why gallium was the first. We'll get to that in a second. But unfortunately, uh, when Intel got one of these helium microscopes, they started working on their 
on their silicon chip. You know, the silicon world is getting smaller and smaller as semiconductor world makes a smaller and smaller chip. So this was looking like a great thing for the future of FIB. But uh, helium makes bubbles in silicon. So that was kind of like, all right, well, good shot, everyone. That's never going to work. But if you don't, if you're not in the semiconductor world, um, my colleague at CNNL is actually does a lot of work on geological materials. And the reason he has one of these is because of how uh, it doesn't charge up your sample. So you can put an uncoated, well, okay, first of all, this is what, we just saw this in a different schematic. This is electrons hitting your sample and building up an interaction volume. And what this interaction volume also is, is a bunch of charge. So this is why we have to coat our samples and make sure they're really well grounded before we put them into the microscope. In the ion microscope, they're positively charged ions hitting the surface. And he helium just goes smack into your sample. I mean, it's really go, it really goes quite deeply into the sample. So the charge is all sitting right here, very small amount sitting here at the sample. The majority of it's going deeper into the sample. So all you have to do is use an electron sled gun at the surface, and that mitigates almost all the charge. So you can put an uncoated sample in your uh, microscope, and this is like everybody loves this. This is what everybody does. Fly eyeballs. You know? Everybody's working with fly eyeballs, apparently, and everybody's got to have a helium microscope to look at their fly eyeball. And this is a pretty cool picture. This is an uncoated fly eye. But whenever you look up <laughs> an example of, of a great image in a helium microscope, it's always a fly eyeball. So I just, you know, for the fly eyeball people of the world, this is your microscope. If there's any fly eyeball, eyeball people here, let me know. I can give you my colleague's contact information. But anyway, that's the helium microscope. Neon, I did mention also, <coughs> they try, they're trying to work on, I feel like I have to mention that Zeiss makes this instrument. I think that's funny. So they kind of failed at helium for being a fib. They're now trying to sort of res, uh, redeem themselves in using neon, because neon and silicon do get along pretty well. But the, the trimer is even more stable with neon. You can only have the trimer form for about a couple of hours, so still kind of a sad story. OK, happy story is gallium. This is the most common dual uh, fib stem source, the liquid metal ion source today. There are some liquid metal ion alloys, or metal alloy sources. They're not too common, but gallium really is the main uh, one that we use as a liquid metal ion source. So this is how it works. This is an actual uh, source. This is a little schematic. But in this coil is a bunch of gallium. You heat up the gallium by warming up uh, this, uh, the, the coil mechanism here. The, uh, the gallium will wet this tungsten tip, and the extractor will pull ions off the tip. And then the suppressor here keeps that balance so you can control your emission current. Gallium's great. It's got this low melting point, so you can do this whole heat up thing pretty easily. It also has a large molten range before it boils, so you can heat the source multiple times. Um, you know, relatively speaking, it's got a pretty high sputter rate, so you can remove a lot of material with it. <coughs> it's not particularly reactive, so it, it uh, behaves well with the tungsten tip, and it works well with silicon. But your current range, like so back on the helium slide, your current range is like less than 100 picoamps. Here you're sitting in the 1 picoamp to 65 nanoamp range of current, which means you're making micron scaled samples. You're making micron scale cuts. 50 microns is kind of a sweet high spot. Anything bigger than that, it's really, it becomes less effective. These sources only last three months, and they're quite expensive. But, uh, <coughs> excuse me, but for the majority of work that one must do, gallium is great. That's what we used to have. The last side, so now this is the farthest end of the spectrum is, is the large side. This is xenon. This is what we have. So this is our, our, our fib, again, with the covers off. Um, it has a really long source life. There's a little bottle that sits right in here. It's got a regulator on it. You just let the gas flow. And this is very similar to, this is inductively coupled plasma. This, so this is also like the ICCMS, right? And like the nano sims, right? You guys are shaking your heads or nodding? Yeah, OK, cool. I don't know enough about those. So it's a gas comes in. You turn on this R, uh, the RF antenna, uh, generates the plasma in here, and then we have this extractor that pulls the, the ions out. It's a really simple design, so it's very easy to maintain. You turn it on or you turn it off, whereas with the gallium fib, you, you heat it up, you heat up the source, you get gallium to flow. When you turn the beam off, you get this blobber on the end of the tip of gallium. You've got to heat the tip up, burn the blobber off. Every time you use that, you're wasting gallium. 
So this uh, gas bottle will last probably five uh, years or, or more, and it's more like uh, it's more like a thousand bucks for a bottle of, of Xenon. Or it's like one of those little plat one of those little gallium thing costs three thousand bucks every three months. It's crazy. So yay, cheap. Although this wasn't cheap. Anyway, it's also a noble gas, which for some people that's important. Okay, so what's really happening with all of these when these ions come down? What's going on? Um, so this is basically uh, we call this the collision cascade. So your ion comes down. It, it actually generates a lot of secondary electrons at the surface, and that is the main signal that we use uh, when detecting, uh, when, when we're, we're grabbing an image with, the, with the, elect, uh, the ion beam. Then this ion comes in and just makes a mess. It knocks around the lattice, so atoms are not where they should be. This is also a pretty good image. I mean, just sort of like total chaos is happening where your ions are hitting, your ion beam's hitting the surface. You get implanted ions. You also get a lot of amorphization. So if I'm looking at this, if I'm you, I'm thinking, wow, does Siv damage my sample? The short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is yeah, but it depends, and we have ways of mitigating that damage. So these are um, some shrimp plots. This is a modeling software uh, that you kind of plug in, OK? You can tell it um, what source ion, and you can tell it what KV you're at, and you can put in a different uh, um, material that you're going into, and it gives, tells you what happens. So, so all of these models are 30 KV gallium. So damage is material dependent based on the sputter rate. So every material has a different sputter rate. Silicon is a relatively soft-ish material. So 30 kV gallium, you know, this is what this is what's happening. You're going. Oh, I'm sorry. I also want to point out this is one micron. All of the models I'm going to show you these are one micron depth. So you're going about 500. Wait, is that really a micron? A thousand angstroms is a micron. Yes, it's a micron. So you're 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 really making a lot of mess at 30 kV into silicon. A little bit less into carbon. That's just because carbon is harder, so it has a lower sputter rate. Copper is really soft. But because it's so soft, it like you just lose all of the surface. So it tends not to go deeply, but you do, you really, you see how wide it is at the surface? Again, that's what a higher sputter rate will look like. So you can run these plots to get an idea of what is the ion beam going to do to your sample. The depth of damage is dependent on your accelerating voltage. So now all of these plots are gallium into silicon, and we're now looking at different KV. So 30 KV, we saw, that's a, that's, there's a lot of mass going on here. But at 5 kV, it's really sitting up here at the surface. It's not penetrating too deeply at all to the sample. And at 2 kV, it's really not. Here, you're, <coughs> you're probably only doing <coughs> a couple of nanometers worth of damage, although the model might think otherwise. But um, in silicon, we, we often say um, nanometer to kV is what you'll get in damage. So what we'll do on a sample is when we do all the bulk milling, we do it at 30 kV because that's fast. Then we actually go to thin the sample down to its final fitting. When we're getting down to the nanometers in thickness, we go to lower kV. And we finish at 2 kV. You can even finish at 1 kV or 500 volts. And you still have damage, but you don't have nearly as much damage. So if you think about a TEM sample, a TEM sample is going to be about 100 nanometers thick. And if you've got 30 nanometers of damage on either side of your sample, because you thin on both sides as you're making that final sample thinner and thinner, You've got 60 nanometers of damage and only 40 nanometers of good stuff. That's not that's bad, but if you're here on, on at, you know 2 kV, you've got maybe five nanometers of damage on either side, and that's you still have so much room. You, you, have, you have plenty of crystalline material to analyze, so this works well. The TEM people tell me. Okay, and then your damage is also dependent on the source ion. <coughs> so, on a gallium fib, okay, so all the models are 30 kV into silicon. So gallium, 30 kV into silicon, we've been seeing this for a bit now, OK? So this is how far gallium will penetrate. But xenon's a little bit different. And that's just because it's bigger. It doesn't go as deep into the sample. Now, look at helium. Crazy. Some people will say, oh, helium fib is no big deal. I mean, it's a milk gas, you know, and it's so tiny. It goes in your sample, but big deal. Well, it really, really goes in your sample. I mean, look at all that. It's going quite deep in the sample. So you know, if you do care about helium, and you're not working with fly eyes, I mean, I'm, you want to be careful with the helium microscope because it gets everywhere. Okay, now I want to talk about briefly here some differences between gallium and xenon. 
<coughs> oh, sorry. Because we used to have a gallium fib. Now we have a xenon fib. You may wonder, why did we get xenon? And well, I can talk to you about two hours, for two hours about why. So if you want, all the details, ask me later. But some very general things are, um, so xenon is larger. We saw that in the models. So it doesn't penetrate as deeply into the material as gallium does. Xenon does not. So the damage is kept closer to the surface, so less material, material is being damaged, which makes it easier, even, even easier to clean up with low KV techniques. So this is gallium at 30 kV. This is make, I'm sure this is silicon. I don't know what this sample, oh it is, silicon, okay. So uh, at 30 kV you've got 22 nanometers of damage. You go down and do your low KV, you end up with three nanometers of, of damage at the end. Well with xenon, you know, even starting, you've only got 13 nanometers of damage. And when you get down to the low KV, you're at two nanometers. Now you may be like, okay, three nanometers, two nanometers, big deal. But for some people, especially when you're doing eels work on some samples, a nanometer can make a difference. So, so yay xenon. Um, also, man, it hogs out. This is not just because of its larger size, because a xenon as an ion is just bigger than gallium. It, a plasma fib can go to much higher currents. I think I forgot to sh point that out on the plasma slide. It can go up to two and a half microamps. And it may not mean anything to you, but I'm going to tell you that's wow. All right, I'll just, you shall go wow. Yeah, like that. So uh, you get much higher milling rates with this combination. So this is uh, this was actually a demo sample that I took uh, to FBI to get a, a xenon plasma test. This was uh, this is one of Faye's diamonds, and we wanted to know for the diamond anvil cell work of hogging out those uh, diamond anvil cells themselves, how much faster could we make one of those cells? It would take about three hours on the newest fib, so not the one that we had here, but the, the newest gallium fib. It takes about two to three hours to make this shape, which is um, 150 micron circle, and it's about 20 microns deep. This is the sample from the xenon fib, and it milled it in 20 minutes. So that's a lot faster, about nine to 10 times faster. And this is a great example, because diamond is a really hard material, <coughs> but most materials mill about 10 times faster using xenon than gallium. Now once upon a time, I mean, xenon, xenon fibs have been around for a while. It used to be that xenon fibs were only used for hogging out a lot of material, but they couldn't do that delicate work. They couldn't, you know, you think about that rain that, so that we had the helium and we had the gallium, the xenon, xenon really just sat up at the top of the link scale. <coughs> but, you know, R&D develops and gets better and better, and this year, the newest uh, plasma fib that came out from FBI, which is the, uh, I would say, the industry leader in, in fib uh, vendors, they optimized their ion, their xenon ion columns so that not only could it make, it could still do what it does best at the high uh, <coughs> length scale, it could also, I won't lose my voice for the mistop. It can also make um, small to EM samples. It can go into that gallium range. <coughs> that was crazy. I was like, you're lying. You, you're making this up. You just want me to come out and get a demo. If you have this, then you've got the holy grail of, of fibs. And then they showed me, and they indeed have the holy grail of fibs. And now we have one, too. Um, but this is great that now, not only can we mill so much faster, we can also make samples out of very small, uh, very small samples, uh, micron size samples. OK. <coughs> the last thing I think that this is just kind of cool is gallium and aluminum. I don't know the best way of saying it, but they either really don't get along or you could say they really do get along. And if you put gallium on aluminum, this person, this is a video we can show maybe later if we have some time, it's kind of long. But this guy is taking molten gallium into this aluminum sheet. And in the beginning of the video, he shakes it around and punches it and shows it how hard it is. And then he, he puts this gallium in these, he scored it and put gallium in here. It gets all corroded after like a day or two. And then he takes his fist and just goes boom right through the sheet. And that's because um, gallium will go into all the grain boundaries of aluminum and make it, it totally embrittle the material. This is a fun fact. You aren't, it is illegal to take gallium on an airplane. Now you, ha now you know that, you shouldn't do it. It's very tempting to take gallium with you on an airplane, but you're not supposed to do it because the thing's entirely made of aluminum. They actually do ship these uh, sources to us. Zeiss had shipped them from Germany, so yeah, they do go on airplanes. But they're like triple contained in, in boxes because it's so dangerous to do that. So if you're working with aluminum, you really don't want gallium anywhere near your sample. 
So that's great that we don't have to worry about that anymore here. Okay. Um, so now that you know what a fib is, what do I do with this thing? Well, we we cut things with it. The main <coughs> the, use the ion beam to cut the, the material. But for some people, we just do what's called a cross section. So this is a sample. Uh, you tilt the stage so that <coughs> the sample is incident to the fib column. The fib is looking straight down at the sample, and it's going to cut it. And the electron beam is at about a 52 degree angle. So it's going to look at it. So whenever you're fibbing something, you cut with the ion beam and you look with the SEM, because you don't want to damage your material, material any more than you have to. So this little thing right here, this is a protective layer of platinum that was deposited using the gas injection system. And again, we'll talk about that in another minute, how that works. But you put this here, because as you saw in that, what does a fib do? It damages the heck out of your sample. You don't want to damage, some people really care about the surface of their sample. And so they don't, if you, if you even if you hit this edge, if you, if you make this box, you're going to start to uh, remove what you care about. If this person um, here, this is gold on silicon, I think, they wanted to know how thick did they grow their thin film. And if I had not put this protective layer down, I would not be able to tell them that because I would have blown away their, their layer that they, that they grew. So you put this protective layer down. That's what this little stick of butter on top is. And then you can use the um, <coughs> measuring software or the measuring tool in your software to say, OK, it's this thick. I liken this also to like, I always use the example of lasagna. I made lasagna. Somebody made lasagna. Is it meat or is it veggie? I don't know. How do you know if it's not in one of those glass cans? You cut into it. Yeah, OK. All right. Or bagel holes. How do you know what flavor bagel hole you got? Right? You've been in, OK, you get it. So if you keep doing this iteratively, this cross section, you can do 3D serial sectioning, we call it or 3D reconstruction. So here's your SEM, here's your fib, here's your sample. The fib is going to cut a sample. Oh, it's going to make a slice. It's going to cut a slice. And the SEM is going to image that slice. The fib is now going to cut another slice. SEM is going to take another image. And it's just going to keep doing that over and over. And each one of these yellow lines is a cut, and each one of these sections is a slice, which is also then an image. And you stack those images back together, and you make this data cube. And you can analyze your material uh, in a 3D model. Well, it's actually not even a model, it's a 3D a reconstruction. So for some people, this is an extremely useful way to analyze their material. You can also couple this with EDS, which is really cool. This is a biological sample. It's tissue of some kind. That is all I know. I asked Yi Shin, hey, what is this? She doesn't know. OK. <coughs> <laughs> so you can also deposit. This is a deposition thing I was talking about. Here's the gas injection system. Here are the, here's that chemistry that's flowing down the, the tube here. You rasp the beam over it, and it deposits these little, it, it deposits any shape that you tell it to on the surface. So if I say I want you to, if I draw a rectangular box, I will get a rectangular uh, structure that I just built. <coughs> What you do in FIB, remember the evil FIB description picture, and remember the models, you know, if you're doing about 50 nanometers worth of damage into silicon with the ion beam, then you use this with the electron beam, and you deposit more than 50 nanometers of, of deposition down. So that it's much slower to deposit using the electron beam, but it's, you know, you can do this in a couple of minutes. And then once you've got, a, you've got enough, uh, electron beam deposition down. You can use the fib, fib to do the rest of the deposition, and the and the ions will never. Your surface of your sample will never see any ions. So that's how you can be rest assured that you are not uh, damaging the surface of your sample, or that your surface of your sample is getting anything into it you don't want, which would be xenon in this case. So here's um, the deposition, and you can see where it sits on the pop in the cross section. Uh, you can also be creative with this. You can make the world's tiniest snowman. And though it looks like it just got into it with a Romulan bird of prey, you can also make the world's tiniest USS Enterprise, which someone did, not me. But you can really, you can make anything. If you can draw the shape in the software, you can deposit the material, you can, you can make anything. So I also call a fib is like the world's tiniest 3D printer. Well, it can print the world's tiniest fib. OK. TEM sample prep is the main bulk of what we do with the fib. So 
the great thing about using a fib to do TEM sample prep as opposed to the old-fashioned way, and the old-fashioned way is you actually take your material and <clears throat> maybe you punch it like into a three millimeter disc if you're working with metals, and then you grind and polish it using grinders and polishers, and you grind it down to about 100 microns. And then you put it into an electro polisher, and you electro polish just the center of it, or be an ion dimpler, and you thin just the very, uh, very center of the sample. And I did this before I, I ran a fib, and I am so grateful that I did, because I will never, ever take my fib for granted. When you do this, it takes weeks to make a sample. And you know what? You can lose that sample. It can go ping right off the edge, uh, you know, right off your grinder polisher. And, and it's like, oh god, you look on the floor, and you see the person before you drop 20 samples before you, and you have no idea which one your sample is. And that was a couple of weeks worth of work. It's very depressing. So, and you also can't, um, you can't really pick where you're going to get your TEM images from. You know, you have this, this punch disc, and you're grinding and polishing, and you're electro polishing, and you're saying a Hail Mary over it and hope that you get the area that you're most interested in. But in a fib, you can actually put it in, you know, it's an SEM. You can look at your sample and be like, all right, this is the region that's interesting to me. Let's go there. So you do that, and you mark it off with your electron beam deposition. And then you put your ion beam deposition to protect the surface. You mill a cross section in the front. You mill another cross section in the back. And now you've got this sample in the middle that's about two microns ish thick. You use the ion beam to cut it almost free. Right? It's got that little notch there. This is going to be the sample we're going to extract. You bring in that micro manipulator and you weld it to, you weld the sample to the micro manipulator also using the gas injection system. You lift the sample all the way out. When you do this, like the, the theme song from 2001 plays, and then uh, you attach it to this fib grid. This is uh, a special grid designed to go in a TEM where it's got about four fingers, kind of looks like this, and you could just sort of cantilever a sample, four samples off the edge of these posts. You cut it free from the needle. Well, first you uh, use the gas injection system to weld it to the, to the grid. Then you cut it free using the ion beam, and you retract the needle. So now you've got the sample just sitting here. And now you're going to tilt the grid so that you are looking straight down with the fib. We're looking at a 52 degree angle with the SEM. And we're going to, we're going to build some windows in here and thin these down to electron transparency, which is what we did with the sample. Worth note here is this micron bar just is very blurry. I can't even read it on here. OK, the micron bar, that's 30 microns. So this is like a 60 micron wide sample. That's crazy anyone in the know, normally you're lifting out something that's maybe like 10 or 20 microns, and, and you're, you're just getting like maybe a 5 to 10 micron window in there. This is with, that's what with a gallium fib. This was made using a xenon fib. So here we've got, we've got a ton of area, and we're able to make two windows so the TEM person has two different places to look at. Or if you do stick them, you can do stick them here, you don't care what happens to your sample, you can destroy it, and your TEM person still has an area pretty close to that they can analyze. And then this is what it looks like after you've been there. You always know when you put a sample in an SEM if a fib person has been here. We leave our mark, our big mark. Uh, OK, so this, <coughs> this is now the TEM images from this sample that we made here. So it's a beautiful sample. Um, and you can see all this great contrast that is very meaningful to Larry. And this is using uh, STEM. So this is. We're doing scanning. This is actually a hot F image. High angular, high angle annular dark field. Yeah, it's it's deep contrast. And uh, as opposed to just diffraction mode, the TEM this is, generates a STEM image. And um, yeah, this is no doubt this is a beautiful image, right? But what I want to point out to you is that we can do this in an SEM as well. And we call, I call this STEM and STEM. I know other people call it this too. So this is using STEM mode in, our, in an SEM. We have, this, we have this availability in both the FIB and the SEM. So we have a special STEM, detect, or a STEM detector and a STEM holder. And you're transmitting through. This is a FIB-made sample. These are the exact same sample. This is 30 kV STEM in an SEM. And you can see it's pretty good contrast. This is the same sample, a 200 kV stem in a TEM, in a, in a brand new Titan. And yes, this is certainly a better image. You can see a lot more contrast. Well, you can see more contrast. But this is darn close. And this is using an SEM. 
So even though this is using a TEM, and a TEM is not something that we have here, and they're very, very expensive, and maybe we won't have one here ever, which makes me cry a tiny bit inside, we do have, we can get really close with the SEM that we have here. So if any of you are interested in doing really high uh, resolution imaging, this would be the way to do it. Let me know if you want to know more. All right, the most exciting part of the talk, the Fib Lab update. Our Fib is here. Our Fib is here. We got a new Fib. It is so beautiful. Look at her. I mean, I know you guys are all gushing. Try to keep it inside. It is a xenon plasma fib with a current range from 1 picoamp to 2.5 microamps. So it has the ability to make teeny tiny samples, or sample at a teeny tiny sample, and uh, it, can, it can hung out diamond much, much faster than we ever could before. The SEM resolution on this is 0.6 nanometers, which is sick. That's just, that's not even STEM mode. That's just using the NLAS detector. <laughs> what can't you see with this? Well, anything less than 0.6 nanometers, but that's really good. It's got a gas injection system. We have tungsten and a special edge for diamond work. It has the in-situ micro manipulator. It also has a cryo stage for beam sensitive materials, which I'm excited to try out. Uh, it's got a, pla a built-in plasma cleaner, a full set of detectors for secondary electron, backscatter electron, and secondary ion imaging. So you can bring me your fly eyes. We can image with uh, the xenon, low currents on the xenon. Uh, it, does, it has special software to do the 3D reconstruction I was showing you. Uh, <coughs> it also has, and we, that software can run that automated, actually. So if you wanted to do a really bulk mill, we can run it overnight. Postdocs, you'll be happy to hear that it also has TEM sample prep automation software. TEM sample prep is not easy. It's not, it's okay, it's not hard, but it's very detailed. I've done it so many times I can do it in my sleep, so I can tell you if I can do it, you can do it. But it takes a lot of practice to get good at it. This automation software is a guided workflow. So if you want to learn to use the FIB, but you only think you're going to make a sample once or twice in your life, we can use the software together and it will sort of prompt you what you're supposed to do next. So if you're only going to use it, the FIB occasionally, you still can make a TEM sample on your own. Uh, and it is open to users beginning March 5th. Yay! So if you want to use the FIB, go talk to this happy person. Her name is Susie Vitale. Uh, that's it. Thanks for your time. Are there, are there any questions? That's right. That's right. It doesn't go nearly. So you're right. I just didn't. I didn't want to bore you with more models. Um, so there, if you, so whenever you'll do the worst damage at zero if the sample's flat. But we we like to mill on an angle. That's the best milling strategy. So if you can imagine that model, uh, when you're only hitting the very edge of the sample, your sputter, your collision cascade is only happening at the very edge of where you're cutting, which means two things. One, you're not doing as much damage, and two, your cut is a lot more effective because the collision cascade you know, is a surface phenomenon. So if you have more surface, you're cutting faster and doing less damage. So yeah. So we try to do as close to 90 as possible. It's the opposite because a gallium, you get much higher resolution. I don't know why. I mean, I guess if I thought about it for a while. Rick, do you have a thought? Was it too close to the sample? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. What you say makes sense. 
push out of it or something. I can tell you. Yes. Hey. So you see curtaining? So it's, it's material dependent. So you just have to find, you just try it, right? You hog out as, hot, as high as you want, and if you see curtaining, you back it off. And you can gen with give a nice protective layer that can mitigate curtaining. You also, we have this, um, we have a rocking mill holder in this sieve, which if you have a really problematic sample that just, no matter what current you're using, and no matter how much protective layer you put down, it still wants to curtain. Um, it'll do this kind of rocking mechanism, a rocking sort of motion, which <coughs> the FEI instrument, it's moving the stage and it's moving the beam. So by not coming down at the exact same angle all the time, by moving that around, it mitigates the curtaining. Uh, curtaining is a fib effect where when you come in at a high angle, it starts to deform the material and it looks like theater curtains. And once you start that, it's really hard to get rid of it. But if you do it a little bit, um, if you have a little bit of curtaining and your protective layer is still smooth, the curtaining doesn't happen in the protective layer, which generally it never does. If you just start backing off the currents, you can start to remove the curtaining. And, um, so sometimes even in a material that curtains, if you go to high current and you get the curtaining, you just start polishing at lower and lower currents and you can get rid of it. But yeah, certainly the higher current you're at, the easier it is to get the curtaining effect. to put more down. So usually in a gallium sieve, you put about a micron down of depth. Now you put four microns down. And if you're me and you're paranoid, you probably put five. <laughs> because yeah, it can just, you lose it faster. And tungsten's harder than most of the materials that we use in a gallium sieve. But um, yeah, that's how you worry about it. You just put more down. Anyone else? Hey, yeah. So you would go do TEM before I'll stick them? Oh, they don't trash your sample. No, oh, I always thought they could yeah. burn them. Oh, jeez. Don't talk about that. Oh, I didn't. Okay. So soft. It's like pillows getting your sample. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes. Well, it's going to be uh, probably about the same depth. So you mean the amount? Oh, well, that's something that Em and I are going to do together. So xenon is still um, relatively new for those folks who are making TEM samples. So I don't know is my answer to you right now. But it's very easy to figure out. Um, and I also just wanted to let you know that because we have this kind of new cutting edge tool, we're the first to do a lot of things with it. So the first time you come to the lab and want to do something, you're probably going to hear me say, I don't know, a lot. But then you're also going to hear me say, let's try it. So um, that's something that I would like to do, is actually not just do EDS, but make a section and go put it in the probe and see exactly how much xenon we're seeing in the sample. And of course, it'll always be material dependent. <laughs>